Well, before we begin, why don't we pray? Dear and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're here among us, that uh, how we live, it it doesn't, it's not on us, Lord. Even when we're, we're discouraged, Lord, it's about your power and your grace and your Holy Spirit. Lord, we would ask that you'd come and work in a powerful way today. That, Lord Jesus, you'd be glorified through this message. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a message on encouragement, which today I feel like I'm the one who maybe needs some encouragement myself. Um... I kind of was thinking about what I've accomplished over the last few years, and I was feeling disappointed in myself that I felt that I hadn't accomplished what I wanted to. And I felt like I, I haven't been doing enough to reach people and to, to bring people in and to, to help people to encounter the gospel. And I was feeling uh, bad about that. But... To, to, to find myself as encouraged, um, I thought about when the Corps cadets were out bell ringing um, just a few days ago, and they were in front of Walmart for three hours, and they brought their instruments out and their stands, and they sat out there in the cold, stood out there in the cold, and played Christmas carols on their instruments. And for a few hours, the parking lot of Walmart became a, uh, a temple of God. And uh, the music you could hear clear across the whole parking lot. And I felt like while I was watching them, and then they were singing Christmas carols as well, and while I was watching them, I couldn't help but think this is what the Salvation Army is all about. Being out here in the cold and, you know, being there doing, so people can encounter that Christmas message, you know. Because we do so much to avoid it. But it was so wonderful to see the girls do that. And in three short hours, they raised $150 for our, our programs. And it was a blessing, so... We are now in the third week of Advent, and and time flies, doesn't it? Two weeks until Christmas. (laughs) Wild, huh? We've been walking our way from the first news of the coming Messiah given to Mary. We've discovered how Mary must have been overwhelmed by this incredible revelation. Last week we learned about Joseph and how he must have felt and reacted to the news that his betrothed fiance was pregnant. This week we'll be looking at Mary's relationship with Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, who being 88 years old is told that she will be the mother of John the Baptist. All of this (laughs) took place at about 35 to 40 B.C. Augustus was Caesar of the ancient Roman Empire at this time in history. If you, if, you look, if you look in Luke chapter 1, and if you want to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, that's where we're going to be. And it says at the beginning of that chapter that this happened during the reign of Augustus. And following Augustus would be Tiberius. And we'll see later that Augustus would order a census taken of the Roman Empire, which would include Israel, which would include Bethlehem, which is then why Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Do you see how the biblical accounts read like history? It doesn't read like a legend. Luke Luke chapter 1 begins as if it were depicting historical events. Why? Because it is. Was there ever an Augustus Caesar of the Roman Empire? Skeptics would probably throw up their hands and say, how can we know that there was ever an Emperor Augustus? Well, divers in the Aegean Sea 
discovered a bronze statue of Augustus about 100 years ago. They call this sort of thing archaeological evidence for the biblical documents. In fact, one study of busts and statues of Augustus in world museums lists over 120 examples. One could say, fair enough, there was an Augustus who was emperor of Rome, but what about Jesus? How do we know he really existed? Well, thankfully, we have historians through throughout the ages have recorded world events. One of the most trusted historians of all ages is none other than Cornelius Tacitus. This is like the Albert Einstein of history. Anyone who knows history knows Tacitus. And Tacitus, a trusted historian, recorded information about Jesus. In 112 AD, Tacitus wrote regarding the reign of Nero and Nero's response to the great fire of Rome, these words. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the, hand of, at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Quote, From a historian says, Jesus lived, and he was killed under Pontius Pilate. All of this to indicate to all of us as the body of Christ that despite all the hot air produced by skeptics and television personalities, we can trust the biblical documents and the accounts of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All of this squares together our, our perception when we open up our Bible to Luke chapter 1. When we start reading down the page, we must, must remember that we're reading accurate history, not fables or myths. These things really happened. So Mary... This 16-year-old peasant girl has been given news of great tidings that will change her life forever. It's interesting that shortly after Mary learns that she will give birth to Jesus, the Son of God, she decides to make an 80-mile journey to a town called Anan Karim to visit her 88-year-old cousin, Elizabeth. It's 80 miles as the crow flies, but to make the journey means crossing several mountain stretches. It's a dangerous journey, but she decides that she must make it. She arrives to see, she arrives to see Elizabeth and spends over three months with her. That is an exceedingly long sleepover. But most definitely a valuable get-together. Mary and Elizabeth don't know it at the time. But God is literally going to change the world through the two children growing in their bellies. Isn't that an amazing honor that women have to raise up such great people of faith? I think of Susanna Wesley, the mother of Methodism. She trained up John and Charles and both of those great saints um, a lot of their songs fill our songbook to this day. She trained them up just as a mother. But she was utterly dedicated to her calling to be a great mother. She meticulously raised John and Charles to be men of God. And through her ministry to them and their ministry to the world, millions of souls came into contact with Jesus Christ. One mother. One mom. In the same way, Elizabeth will give birth to John the Baptist. Does anyone here think John the Baptist is awesome? I know I do. I, very early in my Christian life, I thought John the Baptist was so cool. He lives in the wilderness. He's an outcast, eating wild honey, crazy hair, eating bugs, preaching the word. 
rallying the people, the grassroots, to be prepared to welcome and embrace the coming of Jesus. He's the rebel truth speaker. He's the proclaimer of the coming Messiah. He's the prophet proclaiming the coming Christ. And then we have Jesus, God come to earth. He's the Savior, the King, our God, the maker of the universe, and the designer of the human soul. He's goodness, love, holiness, purity, tenderness, friendship, and mystery before our very eyes. And it all started with Mary and Elizabeth, two mothers. And they both needed each other at this moment in their lives. They were about to literally give birth to two people who would transform the world for generations to come. Everything would change. What do you do when something really crazy is happening in your life? I know that for me, I seek out a close friend and confidant to share with them what I'm going through. We all need encouragement in our lives. That's why this message fits so well for this time. It's Christmas time. We're rushing here and there, trying to get everything taken care of, right? We do that a lot in society. Run like mad trying to get everything done. Marking off the to-do list, check by check. One of the best things I can do is try to slow down and regain some composure and sanity in my life. And to do that, I often spend time with family or friends. That's why right after Christmas, I go and spend a week with family. It's very important. Something about family can really help straighten out the priorities in our lives. Mary understood that when she made the nine-day journey to Elizabeth's home. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 45 says, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. See, Elizabeth was an instant encouragement to Mary. Mary didn't understand what was happening in her life. She knew the Lord was with her, and she knew her son would be the Savior of the world. But she was probably wondering, is anyone else going to believe this? It must have been a great relief when Elizabeth, her dear friend, believed her, encouraged her, and invoked the name of the Lord. One of the best things, I think, when I tell a friend something is they believe me. They say, yeah, I get it. I get what you're going through. So let me encourage you today, and I'm sure many of us here need some encouragement right about now, right in the middle of Christmas season, right? God is at work in your life. He is continuing to be at work in your life. And I hope you'll stay positive today. Stay positive. Continue to have hope that things will work out in your life. I want to encourage you to stand firm in your faith. Stand firm. Jesus Christ is on the throne right now. God is in charge of everything that's happening. He's not left us alone. He's not left us behind. He's in charge. He's in charge even when we go through terrible things. He is in charge. He is the King of kings. And every day you live for Him is, is not meaningless. It means everything. Eternal treasures are waiting for you in heaven if you will continue to live for Him. Don't give up now. Keep going. 
just like Mary, we intellectually maybe understand the promises of God, but maybe we don't feel it, you know? We don't feel it. And she may be feeling uncertain. She may be feeling overwhelmed. Like, Lord, how am I ever going to handle what's happening in my life? Anyone ever felt like that? How can I possibly handle this right now? I can't do it. I feel that way about where I'm at sometimes. Lord, I can't handle this. It's all too much. But recently, God has challenged me in my devotional life. And one night I felt like he was saying to me, Justin, if you remained always the way you are today, it would be too much for you. But I want you to trust me that I will craft and shape you in the future into a man who is able to joyfully complete the calling I've placed on your heart. Essentially, God was telling me to trust in his future grace. See, I'm always looking into the future and thinking, I can't do that. It's too much for me. I can't do that. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking pretty soon I'm 50 years in the future. And God's like, dude, come back to, you're here right now. But when you're there, I will have changed you and strengthened you to the point where you will be able to do that then. But trust that I will be there in the future with you too. And Mary received that kind of encouragement through Elizabeth, who affirmed to her that she had been correct to believe the Lord, that she would truly give birth to Jesus. She went to Elizabeth to receive not necessarily a gift from Elizabeth, though it was transmitted through Elizabeth, Really, what Mary found when she went to Elizabeth was another blessing from God. First, she received the blessing of bearing the Son of God. Second, she received encouragement from God through her friend along the way. God gives us all a calling, each of us. Yet he also gives us encouragement along the way. Final point. I'd like to challenge you. How can you be an encouragement this Christmas season? You've just been encouraged to trust in God's future grace. How can you pass on that message this Christmas season? Maybe it's reaching out to an old friend and reconnecting. Maybe it's mentoring a younger individual who needs your support. Maybe it's reaching out to a stranger who needs your help. And maybe if you're in a hard time in your life, Maybe it's reaching out to family or friends or making a pilgrimage to an old friend and asking them, how can I understand what's happening in my life? Help me process this and get through it. Then when you and I have given encouragement and received encouragement, we can burst forth with the joy of the Spirit and proclaim as Mary did, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant from now, from now until all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Let's close in prayer. Lord Father, we are in need of your encouragement, Lord. So please continue to be with us and encourage us in this difficult time of year. And more, Lord, help us to be an encouragement to others as Elizabeth was an encouragement to Mary. In Jesus' name.